Um, I'm very excited about this next session as well, and we're delighted to have Martina here with us. Martina is part of a long tradition of uh, female leadership at IBM, and um, you know, in particular, it's uh, very apparent that IBM believes in women in leadership roles, starting with the CEO, but also um, I believe some of you have a copy of the Fortune 500 issue uh, where there's a, a Q&A with uh, Bridget von Krollingen, who is another very senior IBM executive woman. So uh, we're delighted to have IBM represented on our stage. Um, that same issue of Fortune magazine has an article by one of my colleagues, Jeff Colvin, that asks the question, what will humans do in the future? Computers have gotten so smart that they can actually do things like legal discovery on the high end. And on the low end, um, robotics have become so fine-tuned that robots can actually pick a credit card up off of a table, which is a kind of fine motor skill that you, know, you could not expect computers to perform even two years ago. So technology is advancing, I dare say, at a faster rate than the human brain is, and we wanted to have a, a robust conversation about what that means. So Martina, um, in an environment where computers are able to do so many things and crucially, and we'll get to this, actually learn to become smarter. Um, why should we embrace this brave new future and not be afraid of it? Um, I think because we are still sitting as an as a affluent society, as a society with a high living standard, we are still sitting in a lot of problems which are unsolved. So think about our health system, think about our uh, energy system, think about uh, undercovered markets, faster emerging economies. And so the question is, if you are looking on the one side that we are generating every day tons of data, we are talking about 2.5 billion gigabyte of new data we are generating, we need to have systems who are helping us to analyze this data in a much more efficient way, in much more speed, in real time, to get more knowledge, to get more insight out of this data. And so I believe uh, the new way how we can build and coach and train and learn computers, it will give us faster access to new information, faster access to insights to really overcome some of our society issues, but also to improve our business models. So for example, at the moment we are investing uh, very much of our time with Watson, which was uh, introduced to the market um, three years ago in a game show, which is clearly not a, the target segment for IBM. And now at the beginning of this year, we are starting to commercialize learnings and functionality out of this research project, specifically with a high focus on the health and uh, life science segment. So in the medical area, in the health sector, you all know we have tons of data generated every day from doctors, from uh, universities, from research, and nobody, not the best doctor around the world, is able to keep up the speed with all this information, with all these new insights. And so we are using Watson here as a kind of an assistant to medical researchers, to doctors, and bringing together all the data from around the world, from universities, from research, from hospitals, but also using, of course, data from <laughs> patients, and then analyze this and get out new insight how we can create a better personalized healthcare for the individual. And I think it's interesting that IBM CEO Ginny Rometty refers to Watson as a she. I've heard her in conversations. Watson is not an it or a he, but, but a woman. Do you okay. Agree? <laughs> You're not going to disagree with the boss? <laughs> um, but let, let's go to that medical example, because I think that um, you know, there are certain people in the medical profession who believe that there's a certain amount of intuition that goes into providing health care services. So is Watson? not only smart enough to analyze the data, but can she be intuitive? Can she ultimately read human signals better than perhaps humans can? I don't want to comment the better, uh, but uh, clearly she can handle more at the same time and she can handle more different interaction and different data. So um, um, uh, the real big change, uh, game changer here is that uh, Watson, and she is a she, so that's uh, why she can do it. Uh, <laughs> she can she multitask. She really <laughs> can interact and, uh, with humans. She can understand natural language, which is really new. 
And uh, because of that, she can build another interaction with people who are dealing with Watson, and that's the way how we are learning. Uh, because if you interact with a computer system, if you interact with Watson, it's also a kind, I'm a data source. Yeah, so I'm giving inter information uh, uh, to Watson and she can bring together the human interaction with the machine generated data, with unstructured data, with data she already has in the system and work on that. So we are at the beginning of a journey. As I said, uh, we started to commercialize uh, Watson at the beginning of the year. I don't want to make um, a forecast where we are in three years or five years, but I see that with the fast changing world around data, and the way how people are connected, which is creating new data every day in every second where you are using social networks, uh, Twitter, uh, or uh, um, 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 your mobile to access the internet, we are creating more and more data. And for us as, as humans, it will be key critical to decide which data are important and which data are not important for our private life, but also for our business to serve our clients in a better way, what we have maybe done in the past or where we were able um, to handle them in the past. Right. So at a, uh, uh, on, in layman's terms, without getting too, too technical, how is it that machines are actually able to learn? Is it that um, there is human input or is the machine, the computer and the software actually becoming more intuitive? Is she able to actually <laughs> take these inputs and put them into specific buckets of learning? C can you just elaborate a little bit on how this works on a practical level? Yeah, I think so in the past, what we have uh, seen in the last five decades, we programmed computers, yeah? So humans were writing a program and the computer was doing what the program was supposed to. So very simple and either you were a great programmer or you were an easy programmer and uh, the result was uh, as good as the program. Now in these days, uh, as I said, uh, Watson, she is able to understand language. So she really can interact with human uh, and she can interpret and analyze language. But on the other hand, of course, we are feeding Watson with a lot of information which is already available. So in the example of healthcare, we are feeding them with all the existing information we have as of today and then we are updating the system with all the information that is generated every day. Uh, every hour, every second, and then combining this natural language with the uh, available information means uh, she's analyzing the content she has in her environment. She is able to uh, generate a hypothesis, and then she is able to uh, uh, um, evaluate this hypothesis given the context she can build, and at the end it's a scoring uh, where she come forward, what, what should most probable, what are the highest scoring, what are the, the highest probability, what could happen next, and then you have a better kind of assistance. So for example, she will not tell us who will win the world championship. Yeah, <laughs> so that's something you may need to do. <laughs> um, but uh, she will give us um, hypothesis, scoring, and ranking, which can assist humans and teams to make better decisions because these hypotheses are built on a huge, huge, huge pool of information um, and uh, interaction and learning. Hopefully none of the engineers are using it for their betting pools. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Martina, are companies ready for this brave new world? And what advice would you give the executives in the room about how to get their organizations ready for a time in which they will have this kind of capability available to them if they choose? Uh, I see a, a, a strong demand uh, with all my clients uh, I'm, I'm discussing and I'm having conversation with that everybody is seeking for the next level of interaction with the market, with the client. So the question is how can every enterprise, every business build the next level of client experience? And client experience always has something to do with do I understand my clients in the best possible way? If we are talking about healthcare, the client is also the patients. And so I think, yes, organizations are seeking for new ways to drive innovation, to drive a better client understanding, to create a better client uh, experience. And of course, using all the data you have available about your clients, about your markets, and in your enterprise will help to enable your employees to give a better service to your clients and to customer, and even innovate some of your businesses because you are now 
uh, immediately able maybe to offer a total new service which was not possible in the past because the information was not available in real time. And so, um, yes, I think it's the right time to think about this technology, how it can help also enterprises, how it can help employees uh, to get um, more relevant for their clients and also how to deliver more relevant information for your clients because as you all know, clients in these days are very, <coughs> are very demanding because they expect uh, to really uh, get contact with you in real time. Um, I have read a study that uh, if they are sending you an email or via social business uh, a question, the normal average client is expecting an answer within five minutes. And I would say most organizations are not really prepared to have this readiness, this agility and this efficiency in their organization to be so responsive and so agile as an organization uh, to react to this. And it seems that I've observed a trend whereby increasingly the demand for this kind of technology is not coming from the technology organizations and working their way into the business units, but rather business units are demanding the technology and going to their chief information officer or the people who do the procurement and saying, you know, you need to get this for us. Is, this, is, is technology empowering marketers and the CFO's office and customer service in a way that perhaps um, they hadn't been interfacing with technology before? Yes, totally agree. In the digital world, technology is getting the number one enabler to uh, really innovate your business. Whatever you are doing, you are automating your business processes, you are innovating your business, you are redesigning your interface to your clients, you decide how your operation is working because also your employees are getting more and more digitized, they are using social platforms within the enterprise. So technology is an enabler and the possibility how you can use technology is giving business leader and line of business responsible people a new dimension to change something in a much faster time what we have seen in the past. We all remember big transformational projects where you have two years design phase, then two or three years uh, build phase. And this gives a five years period, seeing back what we discussed five years ago. So we need to have uh, technology in all areas of the business uh, as a number one um, empowerment to change your own business, but also to uh, enable and lift your innovation capability in your, in your enterprise. So what's a good strategy for a business unit head who is not finding the partnership they need from the CIO or from the um, procurement office. How can a business unit leader um, access this technology for herself if she's not finding the partnership she needs from, from her tech staff? Of course, with, with uh, some of the efforts we have uh, in the market, you know, all the discussion around cloud services, a uh, new business provider, they are offering already um, business functions out of the net, out of the cloud. So whatever you cannot get from your IT department, there is somebody, a provider in the... Wait, wait are you the, advocating and running IT? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, that's, the, that's the, the, the very tough stuff in an operation, in an organization, because IT also has to maintain the existing business. So for them, it's also a very hard job to get the right speed in their transformation about how fast can they enable new business and what do they need to do to maintain the existing business. So what I'm seeing is that a lot of IT organizations are starting to reprioritize what is their core competency, where do they need to invest and stay involved, and how can they free up resources and budget and investment dollar to work with their business leader hand in hand because at the end of the day, you maybe can start with external partners, but going forward, you need this, this uh, collaboration between business and IT to build a new strategic platform going forward as a digital business model, as a digital uh, business uh, in the future. Martina Koderitz, thank you so much for your time this morning. It was a pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You.